Hi, I'm Femi OK. Today on the stream, we're looking at Indian boarding schools in America. The United States government created residential schools in the 19th century. The idea was to assimilate indigenous youngsters into American culture and take the Indian out of them. Now the US government is investigating that cruel policy, starting with looking for the hidden, the secret, the lost graves of young indigenous children who died in the care of the state. I want to start with Farina King. Farina is of the Naho um, nation and her father attended the Raymar Indian boarding school. As a little boy, he ran away. He was trying to find his own family. He almost died as he was caught in a snowdrift. That story, the story that uh, Farina's father told her is our starting point for today's conversation. It got Farina King thinking about Indian boarding schools. Have a listen, have a look. I never really thought about this story in the same way as when I think about these unmarked mass graves of residential and Indian boarding schools. And since that story came out, I realize how so many other children never made it home. And they died in that way my father almost did, by freezing to death, trying to escape in winter. Those are all sons, daughters, sisters, brothers, family, people who could have had children of their own and their own posterity that never was. But I am and my children are because my father was able to survive. Now, as we think about the impacts of Indian boarding schools on these dark, complicated pasts, I think that what we grapple with is, is now what? That question, now what, is part of our conversation today. What other questions would you like to ask? If you're on YouTube, the comment section is right here. Take part in today's program. We'd love to have your questions that you can put to the panel. Let's meet your panel. Hello to you, Christine. Hello, Maka. Hello, Mary. So good to have you here on the stream. Christine, would you introduce yourself to our international audience? Tell them who you are and what you do. Certainly. My name is Christine Dindisi McCleave, and I'm the CEO for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. We are headquartered here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and our mission is to lead in the pursuit of understanding and addressing the ongoing trauma that was a result of the U.S. Indian boarding school policy. Makar, mm -hmm. welcome to the stream. What do our viewers need to know about you? Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me here. My name is Maka Black Elk. I am the executive director for Truth and Healing at Red Cloud Indian School, which is a Catholic former Indian boarding school. Our last boarders were in the 19, uh, 1980, and my job today is to lead the institution through a truth and reconciliation process. Mary, welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself to our international audience. Yes, I'm national correspondent for Indian Country Today. I'm a citizen of the Red Cliff Band of Wisconsin Ojibwe, and I've written extensively about boarding schools, my mother's experience, and uh, many other Native topics. Good to have you here, guests. I'm going to share, start by, by showing our audience some pictures. They're promotional pictures for the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. I want you to look at these pictures. I, I've been staring at them for so long. On one side is the indigenous child. On the other side is what happened to them once they attended this residential school. The promotional pictures were put out there to raise donations. And the, it's the first off-reservation boarding school in the United States. The phrase, kill the Indian, save the man, was famously coined by the school's founder, Richard Henry Pratt. And you can see, those pictures for me are heart-wrenching. You can see on one side, culture, the other side, assimilation. That is, that is where I want to start, Maka. This idea of a residential school, this US policy, so blatant in what it was trying to do. It wasn't subtle, it wasn't secret, it was out there. From your perspective, how do you see it? Yeah, I think it's really important to remember for many indigenous people in this country, this is our family history. Uh, I myself am a descendant of, uh, on both sides of my family, uh, those who attended both Carlisle Indian Industrial School, where those photos come from, uh, and also the the boarding school that I uh, now work at and am a graduate of myself. Uh, 
so this is personal history uh, for many of us to recognize that the reason why our languages are not passed on today as as much as they could have been, the reason why culture is so difficult to come across and, and pass along, it's because of these schools that actively suppressed our history and our language. Mary, it's personal for you too. I'm sorry, were you speaking to me? Yeah, absolutely, Mary. This, this is a personal story and it's a story for communities as well. If you're indigenous in the United States right now, there would be a connection between these residential boarding schools and your own family. Mary, what's yours? Well, my mother uh, uh, is a survivor of St. Mary's Indian Catholic Boarding School in northern Wisconsin on the Bad River Reservation. And um, I don't think she passed away in 2011, but I don't think a week went by during my childhood or her entire life when she didn't comment about the negative experience of uh, attending the sister school, she called it. It was taught by the uh, Franciscan nuns. And um, I think it was very much for her a message of diminishment of her traditional ways and of uh, traditional culture and just sort of, you know, what she and who she was as a person. And um, she rebelled against that and I think raged against that her entire life. How did you see that, her, her not being able to grapple with who she was as a person? Because it was deliberately trying to impact her culture, her, her culture that she grew up in, was trying to be changed. Well, I think she had a, a number of mental health issues, you know, that were unresolved. It was probably PTSD, and she, you know, she actually her home life was um, very bad. Her her parents split up, and before she uh, entered the sister school at age five, um, so there was a lot of things, very traumatic events that happened. And then after this traumatic event of the split of her family, she's just immediately thrust into this kind of punitive environment. So I think it, you know, it just had a lasting impact on her, and she was never able to process that. Um, she knew it was wrong. She had some. She had a deep pride, I think, in being Ojibwe and being a Shnabikwe, as we say, as a being an Ojibwe woman. She had that somewhere, but it was forever tainted by that uh, boarding school experience. Mm -hmm. Christine, help us understand the purpose of the boarding schools. They were so many across the United States, and they lasted for, for years. There's still a couple uh, around the United States, although they have changed in terms of what they are doing now. But the purpose of them was what? Well, th this was started by the Indian Civilization Fund Act in 1819. And as the name suggests, it was to, quote unquote, civilize the indigenous peoples in this country to make way for westward expansion. And um, what we address here at the Boarding School Healing Coalition is what we call the historical assimilative model, which prohibited language, prohibited culture, forced uh, conversion to Christianity. And uh, although there were 367 of these boarding schools in the United States, and 73 of them are still open today, only 15 of them board students, and they are no longer what we call the historical assimilative model of boarding school, because in the 1970s, there was a lot of legislation that came about that reversed that original civilization policy. So the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, the American um, Indian Language Revitalization Act, the Indian Child Welfare Act, all of these things to protect our language, to protect our culture, to protect our children, which uh, reversed the original policy. But there is still that legacy of these schools in this country. Mm -hmm. Michael, I see you nodding. Articulate your nod. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, you're nodding. Go ahead. I, I think one of the things that's really interesting about all of this is, you know, when we talk about this being a personal history, uh, that many of our, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, were impacted by this. And this was, there's was a really fine line between, you know, so the, the forced assimilation practices and the ways in which cultures always change. Cultures do change as they interact and, and engage with new peoples and new ideas. That's not what happened in these schools. Um, and that's a really important thing to remember here. And, that, and that's why that legacy is so detrimental and long lasting to this day. I think this moment is important for many reasons and one of them is because the Secretary of the Interior, which is the department responsible for managing these residential schools, the Secretary of Interior is now an Indigenous woman. And this point 
is when the Secretary of Interior is about to investigate what happened in residential schools for the first time since 1928. This is Deb Haaland, Secretary Deb Haaland, speaking about this at the, Ameri the Congress of American Indians, and this happened uh, just a few weeks ago. Here she is. But now for the first time, this country has a cabinet secretary who is indigenous. I come from ancestors who endured the horrors of Indian boarding school assimilation policies carried out by the same department that I now lead. For more than a century, the Interior Department was responsible for operating the Indian boarding schools across the United States and its territories. We are therefore uniquely positioned to assist in the effort to recover the dark history of these institutions that have haunted our families for too long. It's our responsibility. Just thinking about the timing of this, Christine, and the person who's in charge of this investigation, serendipity. Yes, Congresswoman Deborah Halland, when she was uh, a representative uh, last year, introduced a bill for a Truth and Healing Commission on Indian boarding schools. And that was the first bill of its kind to ever be introduced to address this legacy, to address this federal policy, to remove our children and culturally assimilate them. So the fact that she has carried on this work now as the secretary just expresses her commitment to, to the generational healing that's needed and the acknowledgement that this was a federal policy. I'm going to go to our YouTube audience now because they have some comments. I'm going to put them to you. Um, Makar, can you deal with this one? Ashley Lauren says, I am scared of the result of this investigation, that it may well be worse than the Canadian discovery. Uh, at least three mass graves were, I'm going to say discovered, but <laughs> many of the Indigenous uh, people of Canada already knew that these mass graves were around. Um, Makar, in the context of the United States. What are you worried about? Well, I think for many First Nations people in Canada, the same is true here. For Indigenous communities, this is not a surprise. This is not new information for Indigenous peoples here in this country. These schools across this nation most likely have many, uh, many graves uh, of young people who died and passed away there. You know, there's a, this conversation, of course, about um, the difference between mass graves versus a mass amount of individual graves, as if that really makes a difference in the, the reality that these children were taken away from home, that they were often far from home, and many of them never got to see their families again. And sometimes those families never got to know the fate of their children. So this is a watershed moment for us, and I think the discoveries that will come forward Again, aren't discoveries for Indigenous people, mm. uh, but many Americans will be shocked by them. I'm so glad you said that. I'm going to go to Tyrone here on YouTube. Mary, I'm going to put Tyrone's thoughts to you. Tyrone says, this has never been a secret. It only became a topic due to the proof of the skeletons recovered from the ground. The Native American Indian community have been persecuted people. Mary, your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I do sort of shrink a little bit from this uh, victim narrative that often mm. infuse the way that the the uh, world, particularly, you know, uh, uh, white Americans view us. You know, the process of these schools, they changed over time. Um, initially, they were extremely militaristic. Um, there are times, like in the 1930s, that they did change somewhat. Um, actually, it was reflective of this whole progressive era of education, and I think they were realized that people, you know, it would be probably be better for children to live with their parents, and it might do better if they went to, to school and, and and learn better if they did attended school in that way. Um, however, yes, we have always known this, you know. Um, and it will. I I fully anticipate there will be far more. Um, graves than there are in Canada. And the other thing I think that would be very interesting is a lot of, we don't even know the full number of boarding schools that existed here in the United States. Several denominations of Christians ran them, some for short periods of time, for instance. Uh, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but the Unitarians actually ran a couple of schools for something for a very short period, for like two years. What happened to that land? Was it uh, sold to private, uh, private ownership? It could very well be, you know, that... Uh, uh, we're having buildings and people living atop, um, you know, these graves of uh, Native children who attended boarding schools that are no longer there and, and aren't even recorded. So there's a lack of data. How, how do you even begin an investigation like that? Christine, go ahead. 
Oh, I was going to say, I really appreciate what Mary was saying about, you know, this victim narrative. Mm. There's a thing called deficit discourse Mm. where, you know, when people talk about indigenous peoples of the United States, they often start with all these negative statistics. But it's important to note that we are very resilient people, that we survived attempted genocide and we're still here. We're still thriving. And um, that's, you know, a positive narrative to highlight. But yes, regarding the history and the scope of this investigation, it is massive. We believe the timeline is is a little short and that likely the report will say more investigation is needed. Canada had a five-year truth commission that investigated 139 schools in their country. The work of the coalition over the years by independent research has found, like I mentioned before, 367 schools in this country. Um, We can estimate that the numbers of children uh, who went to those schools is about double of what Canada had. And so we, we think it is going to be a multi-year process to uncover the full truth and the full scope of this experience here in the U.S. So, Mark, Mark one of the things that, that happens when we talk about residential schools, and I, I take your point, Mary, about the, uh, not making survivors feel like they're victims, but they're survivors and they're the, the culture has survived and continues, and culture survives and continues, um, is the role of the church um, and the role of the Catholic church. Um, and you're Catholic, and you work at a former residential boarding school. How do you make all of those different aspects of your heritage, your history, how do you make them make sense, particularly when the Catholic Church is yet to say, we were involved in this and we are sorry we were involved in residential schools? Yes, I work for one institution that is currently still Catholic, and we're making efforts here to engage in this process that starts with the telling of that truth, the admission of that truth, the acknowledgement of that truth, and the work to uncover and reveal the truth that have been lost or hidden or, or made secret, including our documents, our archives. Uh, I think in really dealing with the way that this country has utilize Christian denominations to also fund these schools and support these schools and and operate these schools is a real reckoning for many Christian denominations in this country, including the Catholic Church. Uh, You know, people ask me how I can be Native American and Catholic. I think that's a fair question even to my Mm -hmm. non-Native Catholic uh, community. Yeah. um, To be be asked, how do we reckon with the history of a church that was involved in this way? And I think it's, it's a discussion that needs to be had broadly throughout the church. Did you come up with answers? Because I know you, you, you wrestle with this all of the time. Yeah, I, you know, I definitely wrestle with this. This is an important uh, conversation uh, for Native communities uh, across this country, especially for those who have adopted Christian uh, religion as part of their, their pathway and their life way. Mm. You know, it's easy to turn this, this historical narrative into a Native people versus the church. Uh, but there's an intra-community conversation here, here, too, for Native people who are Christian in talking with the, in themselves and each other and in talking with their community who are really hurt and who are skeptical and angry with the church and that history. I think we all have to turn our anger to the right direction, and that is uh, really about the way that that truth has been hidden. I want to bring in David. David is a professor of Native American Studies at Metropolitan State University of Denver, and he takes us on to the healing process. What does that look like? Here's David. The impact of the boarding schools reverberates today. The pain and trauma is passed from generation to generation, and the loss of our culture and traditions is, of course, a tragedy. There have been some steps to begin the healing process. Many boarding schools have begun repatriating the remains of the native children back to their homelands. And there is a new federal program to examine the legacy and history of the boarding schools. We hope that this is the first step in the healing process. Mary, when you are working on your publication and you are telling the stories from Native American, First Nation communities and cultures. What does the healing process look like? Well, I think before we begin healing, we'd like to see some transparency. And we haven't really, we haven't seen that yet. 
you know, there's a lot of talk about reconciliation and healing, but I think until we get um, both the United States government and uh, various Christian denominations to be very open with their archives. Now, it may be that Red Cloud Indian School is open with their archives, but the Catholic Church writ large, the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions, is not. And, you know, it's, it's quite a chore to go see their archives. And additionally, uh, the Catholic Church, which operated the majority of the churches in Canada, um, they have not been very forthcoming about, uh, despite, you know, government orders to do so, uh, about uh, transparency. And I think, you know, at least from my perspective and many of the people that I speak to, um, I think people, you know, would like to feel better. We would all like to feel better and just try to release some of this. But um, until, you know, there is like real genuine truth, I think, you know, uh, it needs to, it needs to uh, precede that process. Mm. I think Mary hit the nail on the head. Yeah, <laughs> you told me to jump in. So here I go. Yeah. Um, you know, when we think about different models of healing, um, I like one of my favorite ones is by Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. And she says that it must begin with confronting the trauma and then seeking to understand it before there can be true healing or transformation. And I think that last step of transformation is really important because even when you look at different models of justice, such as transitional justice, there is the promise not to repeat. Once the, the harms have been fully identified and, um, you know, in some cases, reparations or redress or some kind of. Um, repair has been made, then there is, you know, the awareness that this is what we did wrong and we promise not to repeat these harms again. And even the United Nations Human Rights Council says that people who've suffered these types of human rights violations have the right to the truth. It's not that we deserve the truth. We have a right to mm -hmm. the truth in this country. Chris, Kristen, you shared a thread that, that just jumped out at me. It, it, it really shows the legacy of residential boarding schools. This thread is from Marty Simmons. Marty Simmons tweets, when visitors knock on the door and my children were little, I used to tell them to hide. They would giggle and take off running. A white friend asked, why did I do that? I didn't really know. I asked my mom why we played that game. It wasn't a game for my dad. It was a survival technique. That is incredibly powerful, Christine. It is, and there's several things that, that come up for me when you share that. Um, one is that we don't understand how these boarding schools impacted our families unless we talk about these stories, right? So she's kind of unpacking that and saying, like, this was a game I played as a child, and I didn't understand that it had this terrible context to it. Um, so we, we need to be talking about these uh, experiences in our families, in our communities, in our country as a whole. But also, um, you know, in terms of the, the impact that it, this isn't a historical situation. The boarding schools evolved into the Bureau of Indian Affairs Indian Adoption Project. And there's a reason why the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978 was needed to protect our children, because to this day, they are still taken into foster care and adopted out and represented at higher rates per capita than any other ethnicity in the foster care system. And that is a direct legacy, because the first Indian child welfare policy of this country was to remove our children and send them to these schools. Mm. I'm just wondering, um, Mary, are you hopeful for where we are at this stage in terms of understanding residential schools in the United States for the broader population of the United States and then what this means for the indigenous people of the U.S.? Well, I frankly never thought we'd get this far. I'm, you know, in my lifetime. So I am encouraged. I think things, circumstances kind of came together at a perfect time. You know, um, we're in this sort of period of reckoning, you know, after the uh, George Floyd murder. Um, and then, you know, this point in uh, in Canada and their residential school work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the discovery of the graves and finally people realizing. And I think it just kind of occurred at a time when maybe nothing else really big was happening in the news and people yeah. listened, people heard it. Thank I've you. actually spoken to quite a bit of people about that. So, Thank you know, you. why? Thank you so much, Mary. We're at the end of this program, and this is a conversation that will be ongoing, not just on the stream, but around America. So, Mary, Maka, and Christine, thank you for being part of our show today. Appreciate you. Take care. I'll see you next time.